Hi everyone, this is Michelle for Afro Expats. Welcome back to my channel. Uh, today I had a very interesting interview with a gentleman who reached out to me quite a few weeks ago and he considers himself and is a polyglot. A polyglot is someone who speaks two or more languages, which I learned today. And um, his name is Christian Moja. Um, I had the pleasure of spending a good portion this morning of this morning speaking with him about where he's from, how he kind of, you know, learned, why he learned so many languages, has he been able to use them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was a complete pleasure speaking to him. Um, he is originally from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And he basically told me that he became fluent in Spanish in three months using his strategy. So I was very interested to know what exactly were those strategies. And he shares quite a bit of information about that. So I hope you'll enjoy the interview that follows. Um, and at the end, he is offering a free gift to the first seven people that reach out to him. So stay tuned for that. And you'll also see his contact information below for those who are interested. And, and I hope you'll reach out to him and or apply some of the strategies that he's suggesting. Don't forget, you can find me at afroexpats.com. At the very least, subscribe and you'll get a free move abroad checklist which starts from a year prior. So there's a lot of information on that and it doesn't cost you anything except your email address and subscribing. So if you have any questions for me, feel free to put them below in the comments box or you can reach me on my website. Again, afroexpats.com. Please enjoy this interview. It was fantastic. And thank you so much, Christian, for taking so much time to uh, talk to me, reach out to me. And I think this will help the audience that um, will engage. All right, folks, enjoy. Hi, welcome to Afro Expats. My name is Michelle. And today I have a special guest on and he is fluent in several languages. So I'm interested to get into that and hear what he has to say. Christian, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. All right. Yeah. So my name is uh, Christian Mojaiso. Uh, people call me Moja, so I'm an accelerated language fluency coach, uh, and I'm also a professional chess player. Oh, so, wow. uh, I speak I speak eight languages. Um, yeah, and I'm here to share a bit of the ideas, uh, help you, give you some tips on how you can get fluent faster in okay. whatever language you're trying to learn. Excellent. So this is a great tool that we can use for our audience because my demographic hits a lot of expats and expat um, people that want to move abroad, mostly to Mexico is my focus. So I'm glad that Spanish is one of your language <laughs> languages. But, um, you know, a lot of people have that question. And I actually did a video last week about, you know, do you do I need to speak Spanish if you're moving to another country or should I speak the language? And I do think that it's important for you to fully integrate yourself into the culture and, you know, not just stay in like your expat hub, you know what I'm saying? So this is going to be very interesting. Can you tell me a little bit about where you're from, where you live? Oh yeah, so I'm from, uh, I'm a Congolese citizen. So I'm from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Okay. Uh, there's two Congos. I come from the big one, the important one. Okay. <laughs> 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 All right, we have two of them. Right? There's Congo Brazzaville, and then there's the Democratic Republic. The Democratic Republic is the is a bigger country. Yeah, I'm from there, but uh, I grew up just in many places. Uh, I did like my childhood, a bit of primary school was in Uganda, mm -hmm. and then I did um, a bit of my high school in Kenya. Then I went to South Africa. Then I did my college in uh, California. So I've, I've been around. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So what? What brought you to those other countries? I know your parents probably had something to do with that, but first of all, we all know Africa, well, most of us know Africa is a huge continent, not a country. So what brought you to the different countries and you know, what were you actively doing there, I guess, at, at that time when you were visiting or living in those different areas? Right. 
So my parents, uh, yeah, they did, when I was younger, they traveled a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think par my, my dad was going to study in, in, in Kenya uh, and also he went to study in Uganda. He actually, he went to Uganda looking for a better life. Okay. Because right? Congo was a bit problematic at the time. So he decided, I have to go to an English speaking country, There's no opportunity. So he moved to Uganda. And so that's how I traveled with the parents. Then they went to study in Kenya. So I followed them there. Uh, and then at some point uh, when I was in Uganda, I got an opportunity to study in South Africa. Uh, and so it's, it's a, there's a certain very, it's like an elitist kind of high school. Uh, it's called the African <laughs> Leadership Academy, and it's supposed to create leaders for the African continent. Oh. So it, it had like a long application process, like almost a selective. Actually, they said it was more selective than Harvard. So it's very oh. prestigious kind of school. Okay. Yeah, so I got, I was, I was able to get into that school, mm -hmm. which was a great blessing. And so I went there. And after that, I went to uh, do my bachelor's degree in uh, California, right? Okay. And where did you go to uh, your, to get your bachelor's in California? Right. So there's a university called Pitzer College. Mm -hmm. There's a series of universities in Claremont, California called the Claremont Colleges. I've heard of them. So uh, yeah, you've heard of them. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So I went to one of them called Pitzer. Uh, and I got my degree in uh, math from uh, Pitzer College, yeah. Okay, so you got a degree in math, not a degree in language, and you speak eight languages, correct? Yeah. That's amazing. Correct. That's amazing. Thanks. <laughs> You're like eight people in one. <laughs> <laughs> Each language is a person. <laughs> exactly, because <laughs> that's pretty much what people learn is one language. <laughs> one language, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, so you're like the full package here. So um, tell me a little bit about, you know, how you started to learn other languages in regard to, you know, you said in Uganda, they spoke English. So that's knowledge to me because I didn't know that. Um, mm. And I know that in South Africa, you know, they speak what, what language is like the, what's dominant there? Is it? Huh, so okay, so there's two. There's, I think South Africa is a weird country. Mm -hmm. So there, there are about I think something like eight uh, official languages. Okay. Right? okay. The, so the main ones are English and Afrikaans. That's so right. Afrikaans is you know when the Dutch moved to South Africa, mm -hmm. so they have their own version of German, which they call Afrikaans. Right. And then there's a lot of other African languages, Hausa and so on, Zulu. So okay. total is about like eight official languages in South Africa. Nice. But okay, yeah, so yeah. is the Afrikaans language similar? Because you said it was originating, I guess, from the Dutch living or moving there. Is it similar to what they speak in the Netherlands or is it similar to what, which, because, you know, for me, Dutch is also German and uh -huh. there's Dutch in the Netherlands. So which one would you think is closest to or is it related at all? Well, it is related because uh, when I was learning German, I had a, I, I worked, I worked, I worked with a lot of German speakers, and one of them was telling me that uh, he's tried to, like, let's say, read or inter deal with material in Afrikaans, oh. and he found that he could understand, uh, he could understand a bit of what they were saying. It was clearly related to German. Oh. Okay. So, but, but I don't know if it's more related to. I mean, I speak German, but I don't speak Dutch. So oh, that's a little okay. different, yeah. Okay. Um, yes, yes, but it's it's all from like Africa's colonial history. You know, every country took on the language of the colonialists. So Uganda was colonized by the British, so they speak uh, English. Congo was colonized by the French, uh, by the Belgians, but they taught us French instead. Right. And then, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then South uh, South Africa, multiple languages. I think the British were there. That's why they speak English. Mm -hmm. And I think the Dutch were there also. That's why they speak uh Afrikaans and multiple other languages yeah okay we have so much to know and learn I feel as Afro-Americans as they label us and I'm one living in Mexico <laughs> um you know because we're so I feel that we're so insulated and I'm sure you've had this conversation and I'm sure this is not you know not uncommon to kind of have like these thoughts about how we're just so insulated in the US. And this is everyone in general, where we just learn English, even though there are a lot of other um, 
cultures around us because we're really a melting pot, especially in, I call the outskirt um, states, you know, where you're bordering the ocean. So if you look at like New York, obviously, you know, there are lots of cultures there. Um, and then you can go down, you know, the East Coast and Florida, get all the way to Miami. And then, you know, pretty much everyone in Miami speaks Spanish or has not everyone, but a lot of people come from a Hispanic background or somewhere in Latin America, you know, Cuba or wherever. And, you know, a lot of times they will come and not learn English. And then there's the reverse of that where a lot of Americans don't really learn another language. So I always find it very interesting when I meet people from Africa, you know, the continent and people from Europe that are able to really speak several languages. And I, you know, I wish I had this experience and I feel like the least that I can do is pass it on to my kid, you know, bring, that's what part of one of the reasons why I wanted to move to Mexico or another country, just feeling, you know, that this is something that when you have the opportunity at a younger age, it's easier to adapt a new language as you get older, you know, providing you started kind of young, it's just easier because you have an air for it, you have a better understanding for it. So I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, you know, your parents kind of moving around a little bit, maybe helped, <laughs> you know, your experience. A lot be expanded beyond just one language <laughs> well, no it's also it's actually a very good thing to move I, I like the experience a lot I mean it has its downsides mm -hmm. so if, if you have parents who move around a lot mm -hmm. then uh, it, it might be you, you have to learn how to adapt to new environments quickly so mm -hmm. let's say I've made friends I've made friends in Congo then I moved to America oh now new friends that's the <laughs> And I got to let go of the old friends. So that, that, that's the downside. But it, there's also a huge upside. Right. And the upside is uh, you get a deeper understanding of life and people. Right. If you live in one place, uh, basically every culture, every country or group of people have a certain uh, like dominant habits. So it's called a culture or a paradigm. Mm -hmm. uh, groups of people tend to behave in a certain way. Right. right. So if you only live in one culture, uh, for, uh, for let's see, for example, let's say in, in, in Congo, where I'm currently living. Right. So it's it's uh, if let, let's say if you meet an older lady, maybe not even older, she might be like in her 40s, 50s, around there. Mm -hmm. All right. And then you tell her, hey, uh, like, hi, young lady. All right. So, you know, in, in some other places, a compliment, like when I was in the States, if I told an old, like let's say a lady who's, uh, I don't know, older, and I told a high young lady, she feels like it's a compliment, right? Oh, you're saying I'm young and blah, blah, blah. Right. But, but here, if you say that, uh, the women get offended. Ah, okay. Right. You are, you, they prefer you to call them mom. That's the respect. Oh, okay. Part. That's interesting. Right. So I call, yeah, I mean, I, went, I left the culture for a long time, stayed in the States for a while, and I came back and uh, yeah, I was calling like uh, one of my relatives, a young lady. I thought it was a compliment. Oh. And then I realized she was upset about it. Oh. She prefers to be called a uh, mom, right? Oh. Mother. Uh, That's so, interesting. So at, at what age does someone become or, be, or is called mother? Because I don't want to be called mother. <laughs> I want you See, to that's a cultural difference. See what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so here it's a big compliment. Uh, Okay, maybe when they're in their twenties, it's fine. But once, I guess, once they get married, women tend to get married young here. Mm -hmm. So once they get married, yeah, they prefer if you call them mom. Oh, okay. Because for them, it's it's a term of res it's a term of respect. Okay. Even if they're not like your biological mom, you see. Right, so I understand. If somebody, if, yes, if somebody grew up here, mm -hmm. they would think uh, all women would love for you to call them mom. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, that's it. But if they grew up here and then went to America, they'll see, oh, it's different. You got to be careful with this stuff. <laughs> yeah, so. because, you know, I mean, mom translates to ma in, you know, our culture. 
And if a guy's trying to talk to someone, sometimes they'll say something like, hey, ma, hey, ma, what's up? So if someone doesn't want that, you know, as far as an advance, that would probably be taken negative. And, you know, I'm sure most women here and, and you've already experienced it <laughs> would be like, why are you calling me mom? Like, that's weird. So I yeah. really respect that. You know, I think it's interesting. I think it's almost like um, what we would say here, which would be ma'am. Obviously, you probably know this already. Ma'am. Yeah. A lot of people will say yes, ma'am. Or if they just met someone, they would call them miss or missus or whatever. So yeah, that's a nice piece of information to know. <laughs> So tell me, um, how did you get into chess? What's the story with that? Oh, it's just, it was just a childhood thing. Um, mm -hmm. So when I was around much younger, maybe high school or something, or primary school, I don't recall. Uh, but I just had an interest in playing chess, but I did not have any, no adult to teach me. Okay. I just had a slight interest in it. And then when I got 13, I was, my mom was at a certain university in Uganda, sorry, in Kenya. Okay. And uh, there was a chess club there. Yeah. And there was this uh, there was this American guy who'd come from Oregon, Kevin Ness. So it, uh, he, he, was, uh, he was an exchange student in Kenya. And uh, so he started a chess club. So I was, I was like now eager to go and learn from him. So that's where it started. And then I started competing in tournaments. And after a while, it just became an obsession. Right? When I was in high school, I used to read uh, like, you know, the, no, the, the dominant uh, players in chess come from the dominant countries, Russia. For a long time, the USSR used to be the, the greatest in chess. They, like, they had so many resources. It was, it was so organized. The government poured so much into it to okay. prove that communism was like intellectually superior to capitalism. Right? Uh, so it, it had like huge political backing. But the end result is so many great players, so many world champions. Since I was obsessed with chess when I was a kid, uh, <laughs> I, I, I read a lot of books and the books were almost always written by some Russian. Interesting. So I really loved, yeah, I really, I was really fascinated by Russia also as a result. But, Interesting. Yeah. So did you read Russian books? No, no, no. <laughs> no? I, okay. I never, learned, no, no, no. They were, they were translated into English. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but that obsession just was with me. Then I went to college and studied math. So I had to turn it down and focus on math which I also love. But then when I finish school, you know, you reach a point and you ask, hey, what should I do with my life, really? What right. should I do with it? Right. And so I thought, hmm, I'm good at languages, so I could work as a language coach. Mm -hmm. And why not become a professional player? So that's what I'm doing now. Okay, so you play uh, chess professionally. And are these online tournaments or in person? I know there's COVID and everything, but... I'm just kind yes. of, you know, do you move around to do them? I don't know a lot about the chess world. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it's a very niche world. Uh, the people who know, who know it know everything about it and most people don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when I was, uh, before I used to travel a lot to tournaments, mm -hmm. uh, right now we obviously have COVID. Right. But uh, so it makes it very difficult to travel or go to events, mm -hmm. but I, that's the beauty of chess. It's not like soccer or American football, right? Football needs to be played in person and on a physical field, right? Right. Chess is not like that. You could play chess online very well. Right. And uh, so apparently the game has actually has experienced an explosion now more than ever, right? So you'd think, oh, well, there's COVID, the game should slow down. No, other games have slowed down, not chess. There's now more chess players than ever. Interest has grown. All sorts of online tournaments. I work with a coach, and my we work online, and it's it's just as effective, if not more effective. Okay, it's very effective, but of course we have some things to be said for physical contact, of course. Right, right. But it's a game you can still do online, and oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's in the mind. You don't even need the chess board if you become a good player. Uh, that's part of the training throw away the chess board the chess board is in your mind just imagine the moves okay is... yeah i mean i don't know if I, maybe you saw you probably did but i watched queen's gambit gambit rather and i thought it was very interesting um and i do think that the ones that are very good you know there's definitely a lot more going on than just learning it you know what i mean so that's something that I wanted to get my son into 
pre-COVID here in San Miguel, they had um, a cafe and it might still be open. I haven't looked into it, but they had chess for children on Saturdays. So if they start that up again, definitely gonna let him give it a whirl. <laughs> Oh yeah, I think I think it, it it depends for some kids. Some you know, it's just a matter of people are different. Some kids really gravitate towards it, and others not so much. Right. So you, yeah, but if he if he actually gravitates towards it, it's a, it's a great it's a great game. Okay. It teaches you. Uh, it just teaches you so much. Um, one of the biggest one is dealing with emotions. That's the biggest one, you know. That's so yes, yes. Like um, you know, like I. I I'm not a real, I don't watch soccer much, but I, rem I remember watching certain games where, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo, one of the, I think is, a, there's a debate about who's the best, but he's definitely in the list of the top two. Mm -hmm. Let's say that. Okay. Great player. Mm -hmm. So I'd see games where Cristiano Ronaldo would play and then they would lose like the championship. Mm -hmm. And then Cristiano would like start crying. And, and I'd be like, what the heck? Why the heck is he crying? It doesn't make Especially any sense. Especially why is he crying on camera? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I mean, you should be tougher than this. Right. My own thought process. But when I began to play chess seriously, now it made sense why. Oh, okay. Because if you, yeah, it's, if you give your mind, body, soul to something, you do everything you can. You sacrifice your diet, sacrifice your sleep, sacrifice fun with friends. You give 100% and you're totally obsessed with this thing and then it doesn't work out. That is, it, yeah. and, and, and you, you feel that in chess. Uh, right. Yes, yes. Uh, the, lo the, the, the wins are very exciting and the losses can also be very- Emotional. Tough. Yeah, but they teach you how to handle emotions. That's why it can be good for kids if managed well, but okay. sometimes it can get out of hand, depends. Right. I mean, I could see that. That makes sense because if it's, if you're really good at it, you know, it, it's a competition. It's just like playing a sport, you know, a physical sport. And when people lose after putting so much into it, you know, they're emotional about it because they work so hard. It's the same thing, you know, you're working your brain or you're working your body. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about polyglot. Explain this for the audience in case they aren't familiar with it. Maybe they heard it. They don't know what it means. And at what number do you, you know, at what number would you call yourself a polyglot? Hmm. Well, you know, poly is like either Greek or uh, maybe Latin, but one of those roots of the Romanic languages. Mm -hmm. Glot comes from two words, poly and glot. I think glot is for the glottis, this mm -hmm. uh, part in the in the mouth, the one that goes up and down when someone speaks. Yeah. Right. So and poly means many. So the question is, where does many start? I think many is at least two, right? So yeah. two or more, I'd say. So anyone who speaks more than two languages, okay. at least two languages can call themselves a polyglot. Okay. All right. So I just need to learn one more and then I'll be a polyglot. Yes, yes. Then you can <laughs> gladly introduce yourself as a polyglot. <laughs> yes, yes. And then there's people who call themselves hyper polyglots. So it's. Uh, and explain that. Well, that just is just like a, an exaggeration. So, I mean, there's really no limit to how many languages a person can learn. So there was a guy called um, an, an Italian guy. He was a priest, Mezzofanti, forgotten the, the second name, but he used to speak, I think, 50 languages or something like this. Okay. Right. So. All right, so he's a hyper polyglot. That means uh, he speaks just way mind-bogglingly many languages. Yeah, that's so interesting. So tell me the languages that you speak and how many are there? I think you said eight. Yep, I speak eight. So I'll start with like our African languages, right? I speak uh, Kiswahili, Lingala. That's what's spoken in Congo. Luganda is what's spoken in uh, Uganda. Um, and then in terms of European languages, English, uh, French, uh, Spanish, German, uh, and then I speak Chinese as well, right? Basic Chinese, Mandarin. Wow. That makes it okay. easy. Yeah. That's interesting. So tell me a little bit about 
your journey through learning these languages? Did you learn them because you lived or some of them because you lived in those countries or you know, you just learned them because you wanted to? What was your um, kind of history with learning? Oh, it's a mix. Some, some languages were learned just because I lived in the environment mm -hmm. and others were learned just out of pure desire. For example, I mean, earlier on, I had struggled with learning new languages. For example, I had tried for a long time to learn Kiswahili and French, and it was a struggle for me. Mm -hmm. So I, I did definitely did not think I was good at learning languages. Um, and then I moved to, uh, and then I was, I mean, when I was a student in California, uh, so I was just in a very bad place emotionally, you know, feeling like I can't accomplish anything, uh, you know, just the, the negative, uh, negative state. Uh, oh, I'm a loser. I mean, I'm not disciplined, blah, blah, blah. Long list of negative stuff. Mm -hmm. right? And so I needed to feel like a winner. Right? This was my main thing. I wanted to win at something. So how can I, what can I do to feel like a winner, right? It's a question. So I set myself the challenge. I'm going to become fluent in Spanish in less than three months. Oh, wow. If I do that, it will definitely raise my spirits. Okay. Right? And so this was tough because I, before I had not been so successful with languages and I set the challenge and for some strange reason, this time I believed I could do it. That's, right? And then that's I also happened to have a very good Spanish teacher who complimented me a lot. And at the time I needed, I needed the self-confidence at that point. So when, when she saw the, pro, the, the effort I was putting in, she complimented me, which made me want to do even better. Mm -hmm. And then I went to, uh, and then it was California, right? So there's a lot of, there are a lot of Hispanic speakers. There are. Right? Almost pretty much all the people that did, almost all the staff that were like, took care of the, of the college were Hispanic. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I just, I made a point to speak to all of them in Spanish. And they'd be like, oh, hablas muy bien. They liked my pronunciation, my accent. And that just accelerated things for me. And uh, within, within less than three months, I could speak the language fluently, which meant I could give, I, I was able to give a 40 minute uh, presentation purely in Spanish in less than three months, wow. watch the news and follow what's going on. Wow. Right, uh, teach a physics class in Spanish, etc. So, so the, the, that's what started it, and then I took on other languages. Okay, so what was the order aside from your first language that you kind of learned? You know, the languages that you knew because Spanish came in college, and you know, Spanish, mm -hmm. <clears throat> German came. Oh no, wait, Spanish first, then Chinese than German. Okay, so you learned those were your last three languages that you learned. Those were my last three languages, correct. And prior to that, like what brought about like some of the others? I mean, was it just from moving around with your family or did you have exposure to it as a child, you know, by moving around or was it something else? Well, so some of them, like English was because I started school in English speaking system, right, in, in Uganda. So that's where I learned English. French is the language you speak in Congo, but I did not grow up in Congo, not at all. I okay. came back uh, when, I was, when, I was, when I was older. Okay. And so the, that was a language spoken around me, but I, I didn't really, I wasn't good at it at all, right? I was having trouble speaking, reading, writing, etc. So later on, I just late. Oh, actually, I also did that in college. So I, when I was in college, I felt oh, it's kind of strange to be from Congo and you don't speak French well. That's that's kind of weird. So I took some advanced French classes and yeah, uh, and I was able to fix that. Um, and then, yes, yes. Sorry, is the connection good or can you still hear me properly? I can hear you just fine. Um, you're getting frozen just a tad every now and then, but it's catching up. So don't worry about it. Yeah, if it gets All weak, right. if it's I'll, too much, I'll, just... I'll pause it and then um, we can, you know, start start where we left off, but we're okay. Yes, yes. All right, all right, yeah. Um, okay, and then Luganda, I learned it because I was living in Uganda. And then Kiswahili, I had to learn it uh, because it was kind of like a requirement in the school system, okay. but I'd moved from a country that doesn't speak. This is one of the places where my interest in learning languages came from. 
because I used to live in Uganda and we didn't speak, they don't speak Kiswahili there. Right? And I was never been, I'd never been exposed to it before. Then I moved to Kenya and Kenya has two national languages, English and Kiswahili. Oh, well. So when I went into the school system, uh, with, I had to take exams in Kiswahili. Oh, so wow. it was a kind of a rude awakening. So I had to struggle to learn the language. Okay. And it was not such a successful, now I speak it well, but at the time it was a real struggle for me to, to learn it. And, and that's where kind of the design, yeah. Well, sorry, where, what age were you at that time? Mm, good question. This must have been uh, primary school. Um, let's see, standard eight. Yeah, I, I don't even know if I remember the age. It's such a long time ago. <laughs> okay, don't worry about it. I was just curious. The year was 2000. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Which year is this now? 2020? 2021. Ah, oh, 2021, right. Not bring us back to 2020. Yeah, no, I do not. Yeah, we, we're done with that, right? <laughs> Super done. Yeah, maybe I was maybe I was 11, 12. I don't know. I don't okay. recall. The reason I ask is because, you know, a lot of people will travel with their children and, you know, they will ask, is it going to be hard or difficult for my child, maybe that only speaks English or one language, to go to um, another place and learn it? And, you know, I just kind of, through your experiences, wondered what was it like for you um, as a child? Because, for example, when my son and I, we moved with my husband as well to um, Mexico, he was able to pick it up within a year. And I think it's way, obviously, it's much easier for children because they don't have all the rules of you know, how a language is supposed to be, especially at a younger age. So I think that your experience kind of shows where you know, even if you moved around a little bit and you struggled with it, you still had kind of a basic understanding of each of those um, languages in the countries that you were living in. And I really think that that helps with you know, future learning in general, and you know, you're gonna get into your coaching and how kind of you know, it worked for you. But I think it opens your and expands your mind in general in regard to this. And you don't have to be great at it, you know, meaning even if you were only there for a little bit, you still heard it and you still understood enough about it that later on in life, like you said, if you go back to it, it's definitely easier than if you never had it at all, you know? Do you agree with that? Right. Yeah. If you Yes, yes. If you had the exposure before, it depends on how exposure, but yes, it's really forget it. For example, if there's a language, maybe when they were young, they were fluent in some language and then they moved and they forgot it as an adult. So they haven't actually really forgotten it. If they went, if they went back to it, they learn it very quickly. It will not take them long to recover the language. Uh, yeah, kids, um, so obviously people can learn languages at any age and really well. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the thing that uh, helps kids, the, the younger ones, is basically there's two components to learning a language well. Right. One is the technical details, right? Like the conjugation. Sorry? Right. 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 So there's like the conjugation, for example. Those, those are the technical details, grammar, etc. And then there's the mentality the mindset and it's really the mindset that determines everything right. with the proper mindset learning is guaranteed with the wrong mindset failure is guaranteed right and so that's that's the biggest problem with adults is they've internalized so many limitations right the child doesn't have a superior mindset because they learned the proper mindset but mostly because they haven't learned the wrong one yet <laughs> <laughs> so, unfortunately so, for right. example the, the baby is not a master of mindset it's just that the baby has the wrong mindset has not been installed okay and thank goodness that it hasn't right exactly. otherwise we would have kids who never learn any language right <laughs> thank goodness that yeah so or, or 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 learning anything would be complicated so yes i think that that's a big part of it is 
you know, it's not so ingrained to do it exactly this way. You know, one of the struggles I know a lot of folks have with Spanish is the sentence structure is pretty much the opposite of English. And, you know, we, I know that I do this all the time where I tend to um, want to, you know, try to say the word and the sentence in Spanish exactly the way it would sound in English. And that's, it just doesn't work. <laughs> Most of the yes. time it doesn't work. It's sort of, you know, you kind of, you know, one of the teachers I've had, because I've had plenty, um, said, you have to learn like a child, just kind of forget what you know, which obviously is hard to do, but kind of forget what you know and think as a child, like it's all new, it's all fresh and just take it on and just try. And because that's what children do. They just talk. They, they're not trying to sound perfect or anything. They just say things and they just put it all together and then it makes you know, sense to them or whatever. But yeah, my son is fluent in Spanish. He's better than me. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. So tell me more about your um, coaching and how this three month you know, phenomenon, because that's what it is to me happened for you to learn Spanish. I know you pushed yourself, but what was your kind of process and what did you do that you feel you can coach people with? Mm. Okay, so basically what has helped me to learn uh, Spanish and many other languages, one of the first things, like I was saying, you know, there's two parts, there's the mentality and there's the technical details, mm -hmm. right? right? Most people focus on the technical details right? because that's the most obvious thing. Of course, I want to learn Spanish. I got to learn conjugation. I got to learn the tenses. I have to master subjuntivo, etc. cetera. Right. This is the most obvious thing. Like, let, let me just dive in and start uh, working on the details. Right. right. But the most important thing is your mentality first, mm -hmm. having the proper mindset. For example, you cannot do anything if you don't believe you can do it. True. This is, this is again, one of the key differences between the kids and the adult. Right. See, your son did not doubt whether he can learn Spanish. True. Right? He, he knew that eventually it will happen. And all the adults were telling him, oh, you're a kid, you'll obviously figure it out everyone expected him to learn it mm -hmm. and so he did but the adult is has doubts in his head ah, can i do it is it possible with my age All right. so once this this is one of the biggest impediments right so right. this is the first thing i do with uh, with my clients is work work on their mentality their greatest enemy right? basically i need to get them to the point where they believe that they can learn the language and they're going to learn it quickly. Right. In fact, they get to the point where they expect to learn it. This is what made the difference for me. Before, when I was trying to learn Kiswahili, I had doubts and French. I was like, I don't know if I can do this. I had doubts about myself. But when I took up Spanish, I expected to learn it. And sure enough, I learned it. And I expected to learn German and I learned it very quickly and so on. So this this is one of the first things to work on the mentality okay but what okay what is your you know if you could give us kind of an overview of what you mean by that because i think most people sit down and they think about things in way of school book learning you know or listening to uh someone on a youtube or doing a du duolingo and trying to memorize this information because i think that you know, along with practicing and having exposure to it, I really feel like for me, that's what works. Because when I lived in the US, I did Spanish, Spanish in college, I traveled in South America for a few months, and I studied it there, and I was able to pick it up, but I really applied myself, but it wasn't easy. And I had a one on one, I spent a lot of time and hours on it. So in saying all of that is, you know, what is the process because there are different ways of learning and i think most of the time I look at it in a school a textbook context mm -hmm. yeah well so basically with regard to like now you now you ask me about the technical details of learning a language quickly yeah right so let's assume someone has the proper mindset mm -hmm. there are certain principles okay let me put it this way 
this is how the entire world works. They assert their principles for doing everything. Whoever obeys the principles gets results. Those who disobey the principles never get results. Right? I, yeah. I'm just gonna go on a bit of a tangent and come back just to explain. Right. Sure. For, for, exa for example, there are certain principles for making a cup of tea. Right. right. You gotta boil the water. Maybe you've gotta put some tea leaves in. Hey, put some sugar, make sure you stir. These are the principles of making a cup of tea, right? Right. If you obey these principles, you'll always get a cup of tea. It's, it's, it's guaranteed, right? It doesn't matter who you are, what your race is, how old you are, what your previous history with making cups of tea is, all that is irrelevant. You obey the principles of making a cup of tea, you always get a cup of tea. Right. There are also principles, principles for learning a language. If you obey those principles, no matter who you are, how old you are, blah, 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 you can learn it. Right. So, mm -hmm. unfortunately, people don't, think, don't see that. They think, oh, well, it's got to be in the genes. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe some people just have a knack for languages and I don't. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, it's only young people that can do this, et cetera. Right. So this particular way of thinking uh, is is incorrect because what you want to think about is hey what are the principles just like if i wanted to make a cup of tea well, how do they make a cup of tea what are the steps i follow the steps i get a cup of tea right instead of thinking oh am i capable is do i have the brain capacity just ask hey what are the principles for learning a language that's okay. all and so i discovered that there are a couple of principles for example the fundamental principle if if your listeners if afro experts forget everything else uh, just here's the fundamental principle of learning. That's error correction. Right, right. What does it mean to learn? Learning means I'm making less mistakes over time. Okay. If I make less mistakes today than I made yesterday, I've learned. Right. Otherwise, I've not learned anything. Right? True. So whatever activity you perform in, in your language learning, it's not so much about should you use Duolingo or not? Should you work with a native or not? Those are just like, methods what's really important is you want to be in line with certain principles right and the right. most important most important principle is error correction if i want to get better at speaking i must correct speaking mistakes right sometimes but how do you go yeah. about correcting them if you don't know they're not correct like you yes, know yes yes right so people, this, this, for example mm -hmm. a lot of folks here will you know teachers or whomever will say just do it and you know, just talk, don't worry about sounding perfect, just do it because a lot of times people, so I feel like there are two sides to this, this particular thing where a lot of folks will not really speak or practice because they're trying so hard to get it right on paper and you know, sentence structure exact. And then there are folks like myself where I just stumble right in. I don't know if I'm saying everything correctly, but I just keep talking and I just keep doing it. But no one's necessarily telling me, um, oh, other than my son, <laughs> that's not the way you say that. Or, you know, I, I get it. So, you know, like as far as someone like myself, you know, I'm an older learner. Um, and what would be advice that you would give? to someone who is not necessarily, you know, textbook learning, because I feel for me that I've done a lot of textbook learning in the past through college, and it was just a necessity for a credit. And I always wanted to learn Spanish, but I didn't learn it well in college. I always felt that I needed to be in a place where I could hear it all the time and I could practice with people and I could you know, have exchange conversations with them and then learn it on the side in a textbook form. So, you know, what kind of like strategy does someone need to have, you know, that thinks this way? Okay, so, I mean, of course the languages can be learned in school or outside of school. Mm -hmm. So some languages I learned on my own, others I learned in school. So the location is not so important. It's about doing things correctly, obeying the principles, right? And we're talking about error correction. So in the context you're talking about, um, so 
certain people like it's possible to become to try to be so perfect that one does not try at all right so i'm trying to speak perfect spanish on the, <laughs> just right from the get go i might never open my mouth because uh, i got to work out the conjugations and and so on right? right that that's extreme so here's here's a simple uh, just application of principle that one can do right so one way to do it is a simple thing is to just record right mm -hmm. so for example i i speak spanish and i record myself speaking okay. so while i'm speaking i'm not going to care about i'm going to do what the spanish teachers are saying don't care about whether you're making mistakes or not right. speak mm -hmm. this is not the time to correct mistakes mistakes will be corrected later right. so for example i speak i speak to you in in spanish let's say I don't know, I, and I record what I've been talking about. Maybe I record the five minute conversation in Spanish. And during this conversation, all I'm focused on is communicating an idea. Right. And I don't, I don't care if I make mistakes or grammar errors, that doesn't matter to me. And then, after I, then I take this recording and I get somebody who understands a, a native Spanish speaker or a Spanish teacher, and I get them to show me what mistakes I made. Here you said this, but you should have said that. And then I practice saying the correct thing right okay so in this case i'm like uh so I, i'm doing both things i'm real i'm not being so self-conscious but i'm still correcting my mistakes later so for example this one exercise i've just given you the more you do it the more fluent you will get correct okay yes so, so this is this is just one application of error correction yeah. okay so you suggest kind of like videotaping phrases that you say and listening to yourself and really trying to improve each of those things when you hear it or have someone, you know, for example, if I videotape myself, I'm assuming I need someone to kind of say, no, this is how it should sound or listen to something that I'm repeating. For example, Duolingo would probably be an ideal thing or something on YouTube where I'm trying to repeat what they're teaching me, but I'm also recording myself so that it makes sense to me from listening and not just thinking that I heard it this way or a different way. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course, it's better to work with like, you need somebody who's qualified to correct your mistakes. Okay. So that can be a teacher. It could be an app. Maybe the app is qualified to tell you, hey, this is the wrong word. You should have used this word or this is the wrong conjugation. Right? Okay. But you need somebody other than yourself to correct your mistakes. Okay. Actually, you're also capable of correcting your own mistakes. I take that back. But uh, don't correct all of your mistakes by yourself. Because you see, you don't understand the language totally. That's why you're a learner. So right. there are going to be certain mistakes that you make that you're not even aware of. Right. And that's where a teacher can help you or a good, uh, maybe a good app can help you mm -hmm. to correct the mistakes you're not aware of. But there are certain mistakes you're also aware of. Like, let's say, for example, I don't have any Spanish speakers around me, let's say right now, and I still want to practice my Spanish. I have no one to correct my mistakes. Right? Right. I can still speak into a microphone and talk about something I would normally talk about, maybe talk about chess in Spanish or I don't know, practice for this, this interview in Spanish, maybe right. just five minutes or something. And then I, I listen to my recording again. Even if there is no teacher to correct me, I can notice, hey, I, here I made a mistake. I should have said estoy, but I said soy. Right? Sometimes you can correct your own mistakes. And even if you do that, you're, you're going to get better, better over time. But the key is obviously consistency. Right? You want to do this every uh Basically, with language learning, I say no days off. Right, that's true. That's important. It's better to do a bit every day mm -hmm. than to binge and then spend a long time without doing anything. So I practice today for seven hours. Amazing. And then the rest of the week, I don't practice. Okay. That is worse than somebody who practices 30 minutes every day of the week. That person is going to outdo every time the person who practices a lot and then spends days or a day without practicing, right? Okay, so what kind of um, practice do you suggest? Is it with a teacher or is it with like, you know, someone uh, specific or just someone who's willing to teach you anything? <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. So obviously the ideal, the best is to work with somebody, like just a native, somebody who knows Spanish, who speaks right. Spanish well. Mm -hmm. right. they, they, they are the best because they'll be able to pick up all sorts of mistakes you're making and tell you, oh, that was wrong. You should have said this. And then you practice. When you practice the correct way, you've just corrected a mistake. Okay. And this can actually give you confidence because sometimes, you know, the learning process takes time. It's, sometimes people would say, oh, I've been practicing for a week. I don't see any improvement. Or, I've been practicing for a month and I don't see any improvement. Right. Sometimes, sometimes it's really that they're not improving. And other times is no, it's just part of the process. Keep right. doing what you're doing and be patient. You're going to get better. And one way to know for sure if you're getting better is just check. Am I correcting my mistakes? That's all. Right. Like if let's say, uh, if let's say I said, um, I don't know, estoy de Congo, which is wrong, right? right. Soy, right? soy de right. Congo, right? not estoy. Right. Uh, so if, if the teacher tells me, oh, you don't say estoy, you say soy, soy de Congo. Right. Well, in that moment, in that moment, I've corrected a mistake. So even if I can't see improvement overall, at least I know, hey, I'm correcting mistakes. I'm definitely getting better. All mm -hmm. I got to do is be a little patient. Mm -hmm. And these mistakes that I'm correcting are going to like uh, basically come together. And then it will now the, the performance. OK, so if you could just reiterate again, you know, the thought process and also the practicing. And as I was saying to you when um, we got a little bit, you know, distorted there, um, is just the learning part. I feel that obviously everyone has a different learning style. And one of the things that is challenging for me is I do just try, but I don't necessarily have someone who's correcting me and telling me, you know, this is the correct way to say it. So I do think it is very important for people to know that they do have to put that effort in, you know what I mean? Like you said, give it a 30 minute window every single day and really commit yourself to learning the language and however you learn it, whether it's in conversation with other people or if it's uh, through an app, listening to a video, et cetera, that you are actually applying yourself to that process. Oh yeah, so basically to learn, um, your, your heart and brain have to be involved. So that's one of my co uh, one of my chess coaches likes to say that uh, heart and brain have to be involved in the learning process. That's so the, the the heart means you got to really care about this. It right. can't be a casual thing. Um, I'm not one one has to be serious. I really want to get good at Spanish or whatever the language is I'm trying to learn. Okay. And then the brain part it means the the mind has to be strained. You have to strain the brain. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like going to the gym. You only your muscles only go grow stronger if you strain them. Right? Right. They, they got us. There has to be a struggle. Important, right? So basically, whatever language learning activity you have to do, it, it needs to involve correcting your mistakes, and you need to be struggling in some way. I'm not saying totally struggling, but you have to strain yourself, right? Right. So it, so it means if I'm learning how to speak, I gotta speak about stuff I'm not familiar talking about. I got to put myself in unfamiliar situations because then my brain is struggling. You see? Your brain is in the process. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the thing that's giving me the comf the thing that's pushing me to keep putting myself in these uncomfortable situations is the heart, the desire to learn. Right. So bo both of those are really key. Uh, um, so that, that's important. Like if basically... And things that used to be uncomfortable can become comfortable with time. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when, when, I, when, when, when you start out learning a language, for example, I'll use German as an example. When I started out learning German, I didn't know how to say anything. Mm -hmm. And then I decided to work with German speakers. And from the very beginning, our conversation was purely in German, although I didn't know any words. Right? So, <laughs> so I would. Uh, I don't understand. <laughs> you got to explain that to so me. So basically, here's 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 my, the principle I used. A bit extreme, but but it led to quick results. <laughs> okay. okay. So the extreme idea I said was, look, since it's a German session, I only is going to speak German. What what I meant by that was, out of my mouth, only German words are going to come out of my mouth. 
Okay. And only German words should come out of my German speaker, uh, the, my, the person who's teaching me, right? The German teacher. Okay. So don't speak to me in anything other than German. Mm -hmm. Now, if I reach a point and I want to say something and I don't have a German word for it, I'm allowed to look up, like, just go to Google Translate and type in the English word. And then it will show me the German word and I try to say the German word instead. Okay. So you can imagine this was very uncomfortable at the beginning, right? yeah. having to look up every word and the teacher knows exactly what the, the teacher can speak to me immediately in English, but he doesn't because I've asked him not to do so. And I can say the stuff. I know exactly what the thought is. I can express it quickly in English. My teacher will understand, but hey, I'm not doing that. I only speak German. Right? Okay. So the first conversation, really uncomfortable. But funny thing, by the third conversation, which was like 30 minute conversations, by the third conversation, I began to get comfortable with this. Okay. And, I, and I learned the essential words to use. Got and it. by about conversation four or five, it doesn't mean I became, I, I was still struggling with German, but I was totally comfortable. Okay. Uh, just speaking purely, purely in German. But you see, that, that's again, another application of heart and brain. Mm -hmm. My heart was into it. I wanted to learn. And my brain was in there also struggling to find words. Okay. That makes sense. So how does your coaching um work in regard to you know do you teach in groups and do you teach like this technique where you're having a student because it sounds to me like more conversational learning you know as opposed to textbook learning so do you offer like a, a group coaching session where you know, someone has to really speak to you, talk to you, and then you correct them or you have them videotape themselves. How does it work? Mm. Okay, so I actually, I'm not, a I'm not a language teacher. I'm a language coach. Okay. There's a slight difference, right? So having, having a, for most people, having a teacher is not enough. So for example, I'll explain it this way. Most people who try, since Spanish is the language most of your listeners speak, let's use Spanish an exam, as an example. Most people who learn out, who try to learn Spanish quit. That's a fact. After a while, they quit. Now, of the small percentage that persist, most of them will spend years without getting any better, even if they have teachers. Only a small fraction will actually be able to be conversationally fluent and get get around with ease in the language right. right even though they had good teachers so it's not enough to have good teachers one has to know the right things to do right. what activities to do what activities not to do so they don't waste years on meaningless activities right so that's that's the work of a language coach i just i get whoever the learner is i help them to do the right things okay I say oh stop doing that that's a waste of time uh, and when you work with your Spanish teacher, make sure they do this and this and this. Uh, uh, don't waste time doing that. So that, that's what I do. I'm more like a, I'm more like a strategist. Okay. So I give you ideas, do's and don'ts. And then I, I meet with my clients once every two weeks. And we discuss in detail their progress, uh, what they should improve on. And we work a lot on the mental stuff. That's the biggest problem for pretty much everybody. Wrong mindset. Okay. And then they go and uh, work with the teacher. So uh, that this is what I do with, uh, with my clients. And then they're able to achieve in months what normally would take them years to do. Okay. So you kind of work as like on the backside where there's a teacher already for someone or there's something that someone's already doing. And then you kind of fine tune it to what is necessary for them to learn. Now, does that learning um, kind of reflect a specific situation or just in general? Like, for example, if someone's in a corporate job and they need, you know, they're going to a Spanish speaking country, they need to learn the language as soon as possible. Are you focusing on? like a specific thing as opposed to someone like myself who's just moving abroad and you know it's 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 not um maybe there's not as much pressure do you have like different mm -hmm. avenues or is it just kind of the same thing because you kind of called yourself a language strategist yes more, more on strategy but of course uh, I'm, I'm very selective about who i work with Mm -hmm. uh, because so 
I'm the kind of person who has my heart in everything I do. Right? I, I, I mean, I'm totally in love with stuff. And so I, as a result, I've, sometimes I, I try to work with people who are not, who are not so serious or whose desire to learn was not so strong. And we just couldn't uh, mesh together. That was difficult. Okay. So really what I usually, what one criteria I have with all the people I work with is they have a strong desire to learn. Mm -hmm. And that typically means that these are people who have a strong reason to learn the language. Right. For example, I work with people who are like, someone tells me, hey, I'm going to Portugal. My wife and I are going to retire in Portugal, mm -hmm. uh, let's say in December. Right. And uh, when I get there, I want to feel like part of the community, right? Okay. And I, I'm, I'm really willing to do whatever it takes to, uh, to become fluent or to be able to have a decent conversation in Portuguese by the time I get there. So okay. these are people with a strong desire. Right. So that, that, that's my number one criterion. Okay. Right? Somebody who has a strong desire will put in the work and they'll, when I give them strategies, they'll implement them. Right? Okay. But then other than that, I, and look at their specific goals. So if you're a corporate person, then obviously I'm going to give you different strategies right? Right. because my goal is part of my goal as a coach is to figure out, hey, uh, what, what, uh, what are your goals exactly? What do you really want? Mm -hmm. Then I have to figure out what's stopping you, including the things that, so there's stuff that people know are stopping them and there's invisible stuff that they don't know. So right. I, I help them with that. Okay, that's interesting. I I think when we went into this conversation, I thought that you were doing more like direct coaching and teaching the language, but a language strategist, you know, that's very interesting um, to help someone, like you said, who has the strong desire to learn something where they need to, and, you know, they're ready to put the work in, and you're kind of just fine tuning where they spend their time. Because I do think that in my opinion, just living here for these couple of years, it's not easy, you know, and, and when I say it's not easy, meaning sometimes I feel like uh, there's so much to know, but maybe there's a lot of things I don't need to know, you know what I'm trying to say? So I think that um, thought process that I've had in the past with um, going to classes, for example, when I first came here, I went to classes and or again, because I've done classes a lot of different places, um, but just kind of as a refresher. And, you know, I just felt like there were a lot of things in there that, in my opinion, I was not ever going to use in my day-to-day -day movements. Now, obviously, if I was in a college situation, that's a little different, learning and reading and, you know, taking exams and things like that. But for me, it's really more about conversational Spanish, um, being able to read it um, enough to understand what's being, being um, you know, what's, what's on the paper or what I'm reading. And then also having like the ability to even listen to the news or see what's happening around me in the world around me and not just stay tapped into somewhere else. So I think that that one of the things that I um, discovered when I got here and it's interesting that you said about the heart and the brain and the desire, because I remember when I went to South America, and this was a long time ago, I was just like, I'm going to get this because I felt like it was my opportunity to do what I always said, which was, it's easier to learn the language in the country that speaks that language. At least that's the way I felt. And I really applied myself and, you know, I was able to do it in decent <laughs> in five weeks, but I was working 20 hours a week. You know, I had two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, Monday through Friday with a one-on-one. -on -one. And, you know, then I was kind of throwing myself into scenarios where I had to talk to people because not a lot of people spoke uh, Spanish or English rather in Ecuador. So for me, it was a different approach. And when I moved here, I thought I knew more than I actually did, <laughs> you know, because I lost a lot of that. But being in Miami, mm -hmm. I was exposed to a lot of um, Spanish, you know, and I worked at a, a Spanish um, speaking um, establishment for years. But even in that establishment, there were just certain phrases that I needed to know, and I, I got those down. So I think, like you said, in relation to 
what you need to kind of like, you know, focus on. I think that that's a, um, a good way to look at things. You know, I've never really thought about it that way. I've, I've probably done that a little bit because when I got here, I, you know, I started thinking about it. I said, okay, there's just certain phrases that I need to use and practice all the time. So one of the um, things that I think um, would help me more is just learning some more vocabulary, you know, and not worrying so much about um, all the different, you know, ways to conjugate <laughs> their verbs. It's just like goes on and on and on and on. So, yeah, I don't know. I think that that's a very interesting way to look at it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, learning has to be uh, I mean, think of learning a language as uh, going on a journey. Um, you only get the, you only, you only take the stuff that are necessary for the trip. That's true. Uh, you, you don't, you don't get any unnecessary stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing is, so this is the, kind of the problem with an approach where the same lesson is being taught to multiple people. Mm -hmm. The people don't have the same. This is always what happened to us in school. Uh, there'd be one class and there's 50 students. Problem is the 50 students have different goals, inclinations, passions. Mm -hmm. So as a result, inevitably, you'll find that most students don't have their heart in the learning because it doesn't matter to them. Right. Maybe there'll be one student who really cares. Right? There's always such a student. Right? <laughs> so, right. so that's why it's important for people to know. I, I help people with this, but it's important to know exactly, me specifically, what do I want as a learner? What is my goal? Uh, if my goal is to speak in corporate situations, there's no need for me to spend time learning about kitchen utensils That's or learning about tourist locations. It's, it's useless information. Right. right? The, the, the learning has to be streamlined to meet my goals. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that, that, that's, really, uh, this, that's really how I help people. Okay. And uh, it's more like, yeah, so there's many ways to learn, for example, I never worked with a coach. And as a result, I had to learn everything by trial and error. Right, right. So trial and error is actually not a good way to learn because you waste a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, I mean, there are certain mistakes I made that cost me four months. Wow. Right? It's like, it took me four months to realize this is not a good idea. It shouldn't do this. Here's a better way to do it, right? Mm -hmm. If I had worked with somebody who knew that, I'd have saved four months. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. So that's, yes, so that's the importance. And, uh, and I mean, the issue is that like language, uh, for example, most of the teachers in language are experts at correcting your mistakes and helping you with the details of the language, right? And mostly they're native speakers. Right. So they, do, they, they, they may be like a native speaker, like let's say, I don't know, I'm a, I'm, let's say I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a French native speaker and you wanna learn French. Right. I can help you with the details of French. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's how you educate the verb. But I can't really relate to what it's like to learn French when it's not your native language, because I'm a native. Right. Okay. Uh, yes. You were just a little bit frozen. Oh, I did. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. So re okay. repeat yeah, what so you said about um, a native language. Yes, yes. So for example, what I was saying was, let's say you go to a Spanish teacher and the Spanish teacher is a native Spanish speaker. Typically they are. Okay. So there are things the Spanish teacher is good at and things that the Spanish teacher is not good at. The Spanish teacher is good at correcting your mistakes in Spanish, teaching you the right conjugations. They're an expert at that but they are not necessarily an expert at learning Spanish as an adult. That's different. True. They learned it as a kid. Yeah. Uh, they don't remember any of the struggles really, okay. right? So yeah. that's why it's important. In addition to working with uh, a teacher, it's important for somebody to have the correct strategies. Right? That's very important. Okay. Uh, right. So basically figure out how to get the most out of your teacher. That's also important. Right. right. And if you do the right stuff, you can save months of effort. So that's, uh, yeah. Okay. That's, that's a very interesting way to look at it. Um, it would have not crossed my mind or ever <laughs> crossed my mind 
to um, you know look at it this way, but it makes a lot of sense because it takes, I think, a lot of the frustration out and away from it, and then it also kind of um, you know lets you know that you need to apply yourself, you know. And I think in my uh, video that I um, did last week, I made comments in regard to. Do you have to know Spanish when you move to or know the language of that new country? I don't think initially you do, but I do think that it's a good idea to apply yourself because as I said, you will continue to kind of just live separate from the culture and you can't really, you know, mix the same way. Yes, you can make friends and yes, you can, you know, do a lot more things. And it also depends on where you are. Like, for example, where we live, there's a huge um, expat population. So this town has really adapted to learning English because, you know, there's a lot of money coming into the town from a lot of people from um, the US and Canada and other places. So they've adapted. But you know, you can venture right outside to, for example, Cretaro, which is a huge city, and it's about 45 minutes from here. And um, in Cretaro, it's very different. You know, you're not going to find, you'll find people who speak English or they've learned it and they don't speak it well, not as well as here, because there are a lot of people coming and going of foreigners here on a regular basis or that live here full time. So, one of the things that happens is people come here and we get comfortable and, you know, it makes it a little bit harder, I think, because a lot of times the schools that they have, like Warren Hardy is very um, popular here and they have like the textbook, they have the um, audio learning and all these things. And I feel like it has a lot of things in there that really you don't need to know. You know, so I think that this idea and um, approach that you have to learning a new language does speed up the process because it kind of cuts out probably 60% of things or 50%. I don't know, you can answer that part or percentage wise of, you know, <laughs> excess learning, <laughs> you know, because that becomes cumbersome and people give up. And especially older folks, I find that. Um, you know, they get frustrated because they don't, they just don't want to try that hard, especially if they came here to retire. I mean, let's just call it what it is. Yeah. Well, yeah, okay. The effort is still essential, of course. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's just important to know, to know the right stuff. I mean, there's a coach who was mentioning this. Uh, he's a he's a coach of fighters. He trains fighters, mm -hmm. and uh, he was talking about Muhammad Ali. So great boxer, of course, the greatest. <laughs> so Muhammad Ali did many things to become a great boxer. But yeah. just because because he became a great boxer doesn't mean that everything he did was effective or good. True. Right. So, for example, one of the things Muhammad Ali used to do as part of his box, boxing training was to skip ropes. Right. right. But now, and some, some, some boxers, upcoming boxers think, hey, Muhammad Ali used to skip ropes, but I got to skip ropes also. Mm -hmm. right? But the coach was saying, uh, actually, it's possible that he succeeded in spite of that. Maybe Muhammad Ali did 10 activities to become a great boxer, mm -hmm. and seven of them were irrelevant. Only three were really the key ones. Jumping rope, even if he didn't do it, it'd still become great. But he might not know that because he's thinking, oh, I did all these things to become a great boxer, right? So right. if you go online, there are many activities. Mm -hmm. You'll be told to learn Spanish, you got to do this and this and this. Right. Maybe there's 15 activities, right? And you're thinking, I got to do all of them. Mm -hmm. But it could be that actually, if you cut out 13 of them and only did two, <laughs> you'd get the same results. That's right? true. So it's important to know what these activities are. Okay. It's like the 80 20 principle. I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah. Yes, I have. So, okay, yeah. that's interesting. Um, so, yeah, we've been at this for a while and it's all super helpful and useful. I so appreciate your time. Um, if you can just like share with the audience 
how they can get in touch with you. And, you know, I'll definitely add it to um, the version that I put on YouTube and just kind of let them know, you know, like what your availabilities or, or if you have a, a website or something like that, or just to contact information that the audience can see, because I'm sure there are folks that, you know, will really want to dive in, you know, not everyone wants to live in the tourist trap type areas and they want to get immersed into the culture more. And I think it's key um, to really understanding your surroundings and, you know, not just the people, but also the cultures and the tradition, the culture and the traditions of where you are, wherever that is in the world. I do think that it helps you integrate. If you're really going to call a new place, your new home, it makes sense to try to learn the language. Yeah, correct. I actually you do have a, a gift for your audience. Oh. Uh, it, right. So, um, I'm, I'm, I have a, I'm offering a free uh, accelerated Spanish fluency coaching session okay. uh, to your audience. So anybody who listened to this and they like what I have to say, well, then uh, I have this uh, free session for you and uh, you'll come out with really three things. You'll mm -hmm. get a crystal clear vision of what your true goals are. Okay. Uh, you'll figure out exactly what is stopping you. Uh, and it might not be what you think. Sometimes it's hidden challenges. Okay. Uh, and the and you leave the session renewed, re-energized, inspired to finally get fluent. Okay. Uh, right. So this uh, this coaching session is available for limited time only because unfortunately I'm a busy guy. <laughs> Don't have much time available. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, if anybody wants to take advantage of that, just they uh, could send me an email. And I think you have my email, right? Uh, I do. Mojaiso at gmail.com. Um, so maybe it. I'll add it to in the, the description. Video. Right. Yes. I'll and then that. basically, if you send me that email, my, uh, my assistant will get in contact with you and we can set up a time to meet uh, when there's time on my calendar. All right. Uh, and how long is the free coaching session? Approximately? It's a 30 minute session. 30 yeah. Minute session. Uh, basically, the first seven people to uh, contact me mm -hmm. uh, are the ones who are uh, guaranteed a spot. The rest, okay. uh, not so sure because I don't have time on my calendar. Oh, okay. Well, that's nice of you. I appreciate that. Um, so what can you give us as a goodbye in your eight languages? Hi, on va se voir après. That's in uh, French. Okay. Uh, ciao. Uh, so that's also in Deutsch, uh, German. Sometimes you could say ciao. Uh, Tutonana. Uh, that's, uh, that's in uh, Kiswahili. Um, and then what other language? Uh, tokomonana, uh, that's, in, uh, that's in Lingala, Tokomonana. Uh, adios, uh, Espanol. Say. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I've forgotten. How do you say it in Chinese? I've forgotten. I speak basic <laughs> Chinese. That's okay. More than I know. I don't know. <laughs> Tsai Jin. I think that's it. Tsai Jin. Bye. Okay. Well, I appreciate your time. I will um, definitely add the offer to this portion of the video. And I thank you for reaching out to share your skill sets and your knowledge, and also in enlightening the audience about getting a language strategist. That's something I had not heard of. And I think that that's a very smart um, way to go about picking up a new language without having you know, all the extra baggage with it, because sometimes I think people give up for that reason. So I really do appreciate you tapping in this morning with me early and coordinating everything. So we can make this happen. All right. Yeah, Michelle, that was, uh, it was my pleasure to do this. It was a lot of fun. And we had an in-depth conversation, which we did. typically I don't do because people have <laughs> short interviews. Yeah, I know. I know this was very long and I appreciate it every minute. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Have a All great right. day. <laughs> Bye. Bye.